Thanks so much. Thanks to all three of our panelists, Jeff, Doug, and Mike. Um, those were excellent presentations, not just speaking to the content of the webinar, but I was uh, super interested in the, the history lesson on some of the medical devices that you shared, Jeff, and Michael, as well, your point about how we can't get away from politics in our job as much as we like to think about the technology. It's also about people and politics, and that's the world that we live in. And thanks also for ending on a humorous note. Um, so I'm going to open up the Q&A now. Uh, the first question, uh, which was posed by Mpo Luta, is a question that Dr. David Yadin is going to answer, and it'll be discussed uh, further in a follow-up webinar. The question is, what about nurses and technicians and their role. Um, and just to clarify, clinicians, and when we talk about clinicians, uh, we're talking about physicians and nurses and other allied health professionals. Um, Dr. Yadin, are you able to, to provide an answer? You're muted, Yadin. Sorry. Uh, first of all, thank you, Shona. First of all, I would like to say how uh, much I'm impressed by the excellent coverage of the topic by uh, uh, Jeff, Mike, and Doug. Excellent job. I really enjoyed it. From history to present to future views, that's great. The question about uh, what's the role of nurses and technicians is well fitted into, into this dialogue because healthcare is a team business. There is no single person that can provide, um, uh, discover, or uh, expanded uh, drugs or therapy without having a whole slew of people of different fields behind him or her. So when we're talking about relationship here, it's obvious that, uh, uh, as you said correctly, Shona, uh, we sometimes refer to physician world sometimes refer to the clinical world, but this is the world of caregiver, care providers. They can be physician, physician assistant, they can be nurses, they can be nurse technicians, et cetera, et cetera. And then we have on the technology side, we have the engineers, the BMET, the technicians, they're all part of a team. So we have to work together. We have to use vocabulary, that we understand together. We can throw technical stuff at the nurse and tell her, hey, you know, you told me the equipment is broken, but that's not good enough. I need to know exactly what the symptoms are. That's technologically not accurate, but that's their language and we have different ones. So nurses role is important because that's the hands-on workers that provide information about the state of the technology, what is their expectation, needs and experiences. The BMET and technician on the other hand is the counter side on the technological uh, team where he or she are delivering a patient ready uh, system, technology, devices. And they have to describe if there are functionality that need special attention or there are special entry to the equipment to make it safer or alarm setting, et cetera, et cetera. So that le level of relationship is highly important and can be accomplished only when all members of the team are on the same page. Thank you, Yadin. I have a, a second question, a question for uh, Jeff. The question is from uh, a clinical engineer for Peru. Rosanna Rivas, and the question is about uh, digital change and digital health in the hospital. Which is uh, the, the best uh, place, the best unit, the best uh, area to uh, start with in the hospital? Yeah, I saw that question in the chat and I'm, I'm not exactly sure what it means and uh, hope somebody else will also be able to pick up on it. Uh, so generally speaking, though, the best places to start anything is where you, uh, you have somebody who's a leader, somebody who's interested and wants to do something. And if when that matches with your expertise, uh, that's like the number one opportunity. Uh, and the other best place is when somebody's got a problem, which, you know, it's related to that. Somebody's got a problem and you have to be there to fix it. 
So trying to think about, well, where do I go? Where do I start? You start where the problems are and also where you have the relationships because success so much depends on the relationship and how much you can understand, how much the other person is willing to res respect you and is willing to share with you what the issues are. I, I think in many respects, the technical aspects are the easiest, even though they're really challenging, they're the easiest because you can find technical resources to help you with that. So go where the problems are. Uh, it was a Willie Sutton said, uh, you know, uh, he robs banks because that's where the money is. Uh, so go where the problems are. Uh, and you know, there is no one technology because all those issues are complicated. There's nothing simple I could, uh, and that's not really what my expertise is, but, but the general issue of interoperability is where it's at. And, um, you know, for those of you who follow that and are working on it, uh, the more expertise you can develop about the challenging issues of interoperability, the more value you're going to be to your clinical partners. I hope that answers the question. Hey, Paolo and Jeff, Tom here. That was an incredible answer, Jeff. Uh, right on. Uh, Elliot Sloan is on our panel today and not able to be seeing him, but you'll be able to hear him. And Elliot, I know you have thoughts about this as one of the leaders of digital health in the U.S. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, chime in and say also looking at the coronavirus situation, uh, trying to find uh, the highest opportunity uh, for the community, physicians especially, uh, and for the patients. Uh, there are lots of opportunities with digital health that uh, provide telehealth, uh, remote control of technologies uh, we see all over the country and the world, uh, implementation of uh, remote monitoring for ventilators and for infusion devices. Um, and we're, we're doing this very, very rapidly. Um, but as Dr. McCoy can uh, explain, we, we, we're doing this sort of as a, uh, a rapid implementation without the benefit of much of the interoperability frameworks that we've spent so much time designing. So one of the things that we have to plan on is uh, on the end of this uh, process for uh, coronavirus, take advantage of the work we've done and splice it into the interoperable frameworks so that we don't lose these, uh, these skills and data and resources. This is Mike, I would agree. I think one of the challenges that you all will be facing as well as everybody else who is worried about interoperability is it's great to have standards but the implementation of those standards is equally important and constraining values, constraining things in the way you approach things back to that standardization issue, doing things uh, in different ways, implementing them in different ways will lead to problems. So it's not just a matter of understanding the challenge of what is the specification we need to apply, but doing it well and with the knowledge that people are going to agree on the way to make it happen. So this is again back to your credibility with dealing with clinicians and helping explain why, um, you know, it's not just enough to say we're going to put a light switch on the wall, but wouldn't you really want to put it on the wall by the door where you walk in so you don't walk into a dark room and have to go across it to find out that that's where the light switch is. So constraining things to being usable is important, not just saying we've got the light switch. Mike, while you're talking, uh, I'm throwing out another question. How can you imagine, you know, WHO's 194 member states, the ministries of health responding to COVID now? I know that's a big question. Uh, what, what has ONC done in the USA from February to, to June now, <clears throat> for example? Um, I mean, I know they've done a lot, but, you know. They've, they have done a lot. They are um, helping uh, facilitate a number of things specifically around the issue of reporting. Um, so we still have in our country a number of challenges with the different health departments and states reporting out on COVID-19 deaths or illnesses and it is a largely manual process despite the fact that we have 98 percent of our hospitals with electronic health systems and it's partly because every state reports things out differently. Everything is done in a different way. Again, back to the standardization, it's just not done as well as it could be or should be. So I'm hoping that our CDC, uh, along with ONC and CMS can coordinate uh, the requirements for how things are reported so that we can have a uniform, simple standard to make it happen.
Thanks, Mike. So Sean and Paolo, do you see some other questions you want to get us to respond to? A couple minutes remaining. So I see one in the chat box here. This is Mike. Uh, is it important to have an HTMC agency at government level? Um, and the answer is yes. Uh, and the US government does have one. Uh, we have that through, it's not a single agency, but we have the FDA, which is over medical devices. We have ONC, which is over the certification of uh, technology. We have uh, CMS, which is over how people get paid if they use the technology. Uh, unfortunately, I think because this cross uh, or cuts across a large number of, of areas, uh, it, large countries may not be able to have a single entity that does all of that. It all falls under our Department of HHS, Health and Human Services, but there are um, so many different areas that are impacted, no single agency gets the full um, weight of determining what happens for health technology management or et cetera. I would, I'm not gonna ask a specific question to a particular person, but I would throw out a question for everyone on the webinar to just think about, which is obviously this pandemic has been devastating in many ways, but it's also been a real opportunity for those of us who work as clinical engineering professionals and those of us who partner and work with clinicians uh, to do things differently, um, to share our stories. And it's been a time where there's a lot more coverage basically about our world and what we do for work. So I'd encourage everyone to think about how you can share those stories in your respective countries and in your respective health systems to really focus on the contribution that we make. So Shona, I think that a uh, good uh, point to put out to anybody who is uh, on the uh, webinar town hall today but also to let them know that uh, those that put the questions in the uh, question and answer block will be recorded and put out back on the uh, distribution of material later on. So please go ahead and use that to uh, signal your particular question or answer to issue discussed today. Folks, it's uh, two minutes after, and uh, it's been an incredible experience here. Uh, I can say that humbly because I didn't do the work. These other folks did. Um, our next webinar will be on uh, Wednesday, July 15th at the same time, and it'll be on clinical engineers' unique contribution to innovation in health technology around the world, a really wonderful topic. I know we're going to have one of our speakers will be uh, Dr. Jatinder Sharma from India, who's in charge of the Make Devices in India program and an unbelievable number of other things that he's involved with there and, and others. So uh, we're looking forward to that and uh, thank you for your time today. Great job, everybody. Thank you for having me. Yep, thanks Bye. for organizing, Tom. Bye, everybody. Thank you, John, everybody. Bye, thanks Bye. So Bye, Bye, Jeff. Thank you all. Nice Bye, to see everybody. you, Dean. And and here thanks, you everybody. Bye-bye. Buenas tardes. Oh.